So ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome please to Helen Sewell. I think there needs to be more understanding about this age of Aquarius. Um, so I'm going to take a look at the uh, procession of the equinoxes and how much that is playing such a big part in what's going on today. So here we have a, a diagram of where the sun is placed. Now, as you can imagine, there's lots and lots of arguments amongst astrologers as to when the date of Aquarius is about to commence. Well, um, I reckon there's a kind of 200-year overlap, basically, and there's not sort of one pinpoint in time. Though I reckon that um, the 21st of December 2012 was a pretty good marker, and I spoke quite a bit about that in, in my last talk. Now, the procession of the equinoxes, the, the great cycle, if you like, is 25,920 years long. And because all the different signs are different sizes, um, then you can't really divide it equally. But because astrology is a symbolic language, I think that, that we can. And therefore, if you divide that um, by 12, we get um, 12 segments of 2,160 years each. And if we look at the ages, you can give or take 200 years. But as you can see, we are um, on, the, on the cusp, if you like, of the age of, uh, from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. And I think, and when I go through the talk, you'll be able to uh, maybe identify with what I'm trying to say in terms of um, a feeling, a feeling for the age and what's going on. The procession of the ages goes backwards. So let's take uh, a look at uh, a couple of them, just to, just to give you an idea of how it manifests in the collective. So here is the age of Taurus. Now, um, in the age of Taurus, we have the height of the Egyptian civilization. Um, and Taurus is fixed earth. So it's like the material establishment of a civilization, if you like. So being fixed earth, it rules all things to do with like farming and agriculture. And we saw the, the great irrigation of the River Nile. It's ruled by the planet Venus. So it's a time when there was a lot of fantastic art and beauty. And also the veneration of the bull had extreme significance at this time, and priests would select a living bull to represent the god Apis, and preside, who presided over the underworld. Now, when you look at each age, you have to bring in the opposite sign. And for Taurus, it's Scorpio. And uh, one of the things that Scorpio rules is death. And if you think of, of how that comes into their culture, so they built these huge pyramids, didn't they? Funeral uh, uh, graves, if you like. Um, and they packed them with their Taurian possessions. And so there you have that marrying of the, of the two ends of, of the polarity, because you've got Taurus, which is the structure of the pyramid, and then you've got Scorpio, which is to do with death. And then the iconography of Air, the Aries ram replaced the sacred bull, or bull of heaven, if you like, in the second millennium BC onwards. And Moses who sort of personified Aries, actually, the beginning of the age of Aries. Here we see him overturning the golden calf. So, to me, incredibly, this is so symbolic of the turning over of the ages, of destroying the age of Taurus and letting the age of Aries come in. And then, when we come into the age of Aries, of course, and here's some uh, pictures denoting uh, the ram iconography, 
We've got the Roman battering ram there. We've got uh, the 5th century BC Archimenid um, and the silver ram Riton, and that was from Iran. Um, and the ram iconography was large uh, across many cultures, actually. It was part of the core mythologies of Egypt, pre-Christian Europe, classical Greece, West Africa, and Judeo-Christian tradition. And Egypt was seen to make the tr transition during this period from being quite peaceful to a much bloodier society. And Ares is ruled by the god of war, Mars. And the Roman Empire came to its height at this time with its highly skilled armies. And their legions that, that would go out conquering different places were always accompanied by a live ram on their campaigns. And if you look at the opposite sign to Ares, which is Libra, the scales of justice, during this time it brought in the distinct set of laws and mores. So if we now come into the age of Pisces and we look at the, um, the fish iconography of, of this, this age. Um, we've got Pisces, which is ruled by the planet Neptune. And Jupiter used to be its old ruler before Neptune was discovered. So Neptune rules the spiritual, the non-material, that deep longing in all of us to return back to the source. So if you can imagine there being more emphasis on the afterlife than our physical incarnation in this material world. And you can see that interest in the afterlife from uh, religious martyrdom of years gone by to the suicide bombers of modern day terrorists. There's, during the, uh, the age of, of Pisces with Neptune ruling it, ruling it, there's almost like a kind of a distaste for the physical body. It's almost like we're wanting to transcend the body to gain union with the Godhead. And the Jupiter, which also rules uh, Pisces, is the dogma, philosophy, theology, and religious laws of the time. Um, and in fact, the church owned vast tracts of land, didn't it? Which is a, a source of much power and wealth. Jupiter also rules pomp and ceremony, and we've, had, we, we've seen a lot of that in, in church ceremonies. And, of course, the opposite sign to Pisces is Virgo. And if you think of the daily ritual and desire to achieve cleanliness of mind and body, um, Pisces is the most sensitive sign of the zodiac. It's very watery and emotional and tends to react to things in a very strongly emotional way. And think how quickly we've, we've sort of gone into wars or um, into conflict, out from a place of emotion. And of course, during this whole era of um, Pisces, um, it's been dominated by uh, Jesus. And Jesus came to represent the essence of this age, really. And if you think of, of the symbolism of this, because Christ represents Pisces, and Mary represents the opposite sign, Vir Virgo, the Virgin. And it was well known that he took his disciples from fishermen. And if you think of like par parables like uh, of the loaves and the fishes, that's, if you like, the fishes of Pisces and the loaves of, of bread uh, from Virgo. The wheat, you know, the symbolism for Virgo, the, the, the maiden with the sheaf of wheat. So, going back to the equinox, um, when Jesus was asked by his disciples where the next Passover would be, he replied, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. 
That's from Jesus, Luke 22.10. And it's almost like him saying the next, next age, really, which is Aquarius, and the symbolism for Aquarius is the man with the pitcher of water. So we're now on the brink of a massive shift. We're like in the death throes of the previous age and entering into a new age. And when we have the death of something, there's always a kind of collective anxiety around, especially amongst um, sensitive people who are aware of this change. And I think you can see it in the amount of uh, mental illness that, that's really coming to the fore at the moment. Because we don't know what the next stage is bringing. We don't know uh, what, this, what we're transitioning into. But we can get a lot of clues. And this is where astrology can help, because we can get a lot of clues as to looking at the, at the meaning of this sign. So I reckon it's going to take a couple of hundred years to really get into Aquarius, but then it's going to last for another 2,000-odd years. So if you can only imagine what is going to unfold at this time. So let's look more at the sign of Aquarius. Aquarius is one of the air signs, and uh, which is most associated with the mind and communication. And with Aquarius, it's especially associated with new technology. It's a collective sign, like Pisces was, but it's more to do with the connection of everyone on a mind level, whereas uh, Pisces was much more a connection on a spiritual or a, an emotional level. Um, that words to describe Aquarius are detached, rational, reasonable, humanitarian, idealistic, innovative, and they're also very tolerant of other people's views and lifestyles. So if we look at Aquarius and Leo, because Leo is the opposite sign, um, and so we always have to take that into consideration. But of course, Leo has a very different energy to Aquarius. Now, I want to... Um, yes, sorry, I'll just go back a second to tell you a bit more about Leo and you, you can understand how different it is. Leo... All, all the signs rule a part of the body, and Leo rules the heart. And Aquarius rules the circulatory system. Which, so it's a very interesting connection between these two signs. Uh, Leo is the king of the jungle. Um, it likes to be the leader. It likes to be the king, and uh, you know, above everybody else, which is quite interesting because Aquarius believe that all men and women are equal. So you have that strange paradox. Aquarius is a very political sign, so it's interesting to see how the old systems of governing will change a lot as we get more into Aquarius. So Aquarius loves systems. Uh, astrology is a system, if you like, and it's ruled by Aquarius and its ruler Uranus. And in terms of the new gods that are going to uh, represent this er era, well, you can use your imagination when it comes to this. Uh, it's, it's my belief that it will be the fact that we are all God. You know, the fact that we can create a mammal out of stem cells in the laboratory now, it's almost like it's quite a godlike act in a way. So the old gods will, will gradually disappear. Now, Uranus, uh, Aquarius is ruled by the uh, planet Uranus, and its old ruler was Saturn. And what does this mean? Because obviously the planets which rule the sign uh, give, uh, gives us a lot of information. So to get a deeper understanding, I want to just briefly look at these two planets. So here we have um, a picture of the planet Uranus, 
Uh, he's the maverick of the solar system. Even his rings are eccentric. They, they, they're going vertically rather than hor horizontally around the planet. Now, here we see on, on the uh, left-hand side a stylized image of Uranus, the sky god. So he represents pure, rational, masculine thought. He comes down and he mates with the earth goddess Gaia, who is earthy and messy and chaotic. And he, they're incredibly uh, fertile. And each day he comes down and mates with her and she produces loads and loads of children. But they're not perfect. And Uranus is the planet most associated with perfection. He wants everything to be perfect, everything in its place. And he's horrified by, by these monsters that she's produced, and he pushes them deep back inside her belly, back into, down deep into Tartarus, so that they don't offend his sight. Now, um, Bear this in mind when, when um, I'm going through this, this talk about this uh, image of Uranus, because his dream is the of utopia, basically. He's the great awakener, and he brings breakthroughs often in quite a, a sudden and shocking way. So let's have a quick look at Saturn, the old ruler of Aquarius. Before the uh, discovery of the three outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, Saturn marked the boundary of our solar system, didn't he? He was the last planet we could see with the naked eye. And he's the one who shows us our earthly limits. He's like the strict parent of the solar system and shows us the hard reality of life. He rules the material world and therefore science um, he's the one that, that wants exact proof, you know, that something exists materially. And so um, he has quite an interesting time, really, because a lot of people identify with, with Saturn. But in a way, he tempers the uh, Uranian side of Aquarius that thinks it can transcend the world of matter. Those people that think that they can defy age and time and warts and wrinkles and cellulite and all that stuff. And Saturn says, no, no, everything must die. For instance, there's a, a Russian millionaire, Dmitry Itzkov, who, deter who is determined to be able to upload a person's consciousness into a computer in his lifetime. But I personally don't think that's ever going to happen. Uh, bec because we're, we're ruled by our physical limits of this incarnation. So let's look in more detail at the themes of this new era, bearing in mind the energy of these two planets. And I'm sure you'll be able to um, go along with me when, when we can tell that the age of Aquarius is definitely happening already. Uh, all the signs are either masculine or feminine. Now, with uh, Aquarius, it's quite a bit different because it's much more androgynous, with the sexes both being equal. Now, I'm not sure the inclination towards, um, you know, this sort of classical beauty in a way, but everybody all the same, almost like sort of Stepford Wife type thing, where, where everybody looks the same. Because uh, Aquarius does like to be different. It does like to be unique. Um, but then, if you, if you remember um, in the film The Life of Brian, where they're all stood in front of him chanting, we're all individuals, but they're all chanting in unison. It's... It's uh, an interesting paradox, that one. So, um, in terms of our homes, what, what do Aquarian homes look like? Aquarius loves airy places, clean lines and zero clutter. And they say that our homes represent our psyche, so it's 
out with all the sentimental Pisces knickknacks and objects we get enormously attached to, and in with the Aquarian virtual storage and um, no clutter. And in terms of relationships, where's, where's that had, heading? Um, now, already, can you believe, in, in some cases, in some countries, I think Japan has already got them, is they're using uh, robots as carers. Now, this is almost difficult to get your head round, but um, in terms of objects, think how a child kind of projects whatever they want to onto their toys, their cuddlies, if you like, and the same thing, I think, is going to manifest with, with our robots because we'll probably all end up with one. And what kind of relationship are we going to have with these? And in the extreme case, of course, what's coming in are what are called um, sex robots. And I think this is, this is uh, something that needs addressing because things are coming in very quickly and we're not um, catching up in time. Now, David Levy, in his book, Love and Sex with Robots, 2007, has a much more utopian view of sex robots. As he sees it, almost everyone wants someone to love, but many people have no one. If this natural human desire can be satisfied for everyone who is capable of loving, surely the world would be a much happier place. Well... <laughs> Again, this is difficult to get our heads around. But do you know what I was saying about each age has its own focus? It's like picking up a different pair of spectacles with different coloured lenses in. And so we're going to have to address these because these are, are being manufactured at the moment and there's a lot of people out there that, um, you know, they, they don't relate easily. Aquarius um, is friendly to all, but there's a detachment there. It's very, very different to the Piscean age, where we, we attach to each other much more emotionally. And when we think about its opposite sign, Leo, um, because Leo wants to be the centre of attention, doesn't it? it? It wants to be the, the all and um, self-centred. Not always in a negative way, it just is. It's, it's ruled by the sun, which is the centre of the universe, and all the other planets satellite around it. And it's funny how we see it, don't we, with, with the selfie stick. And even all our smartphones and laptops and stuff, they're all centered around our own needs, what we need as people. Um, so this is going to be, again, a, a, we're already in it, and, and of course, um, anybody over a certain age, they, they um, maybe struggle with this. But as the new generations come in, it, it will just be normal for them. And, of course, the big one, which is in the news at the moment, is robots taking over our jobs. And there, there will be a truth to this. We already have driverless trucks on the road. Uh, we've got machines that can do builders' work by, um, you know, building walls. Um, factories that are automated. And in America, there's even a, a fully automated McDonald's. So you don't ever have to deal with a person at all. So you can see the kind of world that, um, you know, we're, we're coming into. And also, with astrology, obviously the planets and the, the cycles that they make through the signs have a profound effect on us. So I want to look at the three outer planets, because these are the epoch-changing uh, planets, really. And if we look at uh, Uranus through the signs, so, as I say, with Uranus, it brings kind of things that are quite shocking, 
um, it's also very interesting to know what was going on when the outer planets were discovered. So Uranus was discovered in 1781, and if you think back to the late 1700s, the whole world seemed to be in revolution. We just had the American Revolution, the French Revolution was coming in, the Industrial Revolution. It's about overturning the old for the new to come in. And in the French Revolution, liberté, fraternité, and égalité were the, were the catchphrase. And, and that just about sums Uranus up. So Uranus um, rules Aquarius and spends seven years in each sign. And what was really interesting was that as soon as Uranus went into the warlike sign of Aries, you can imagine that revolutionary spirit, how it kind of had been very pacified in Pisces, suddenly erupted into the world. And this is when we had uh, the Arab Spring. And, uh, of course, um, the rise of, of Isis, of Isis, um, now, the thing about revolution is that it comes from a very idealistic place, doesn't it? It's, it's like that vision of what could be, that utopian vision, vision of Uranus. Um, but it's, because it's very detached, it's that masculine, rational thought, it's not really thinking about all the bloodshed and human cost on the road to that ideal. So... Um, that's an example of um, the freedom that comes with Uranus. But what about uh, truth? Uranus, it likes to shine the light of truth on things and think how much uh, has been unearthed, if you like, since um, 2011. We have the whole Hillsborough expose, uh, paedophiles being exposed. This is... Um, you know, a very, very significant time, uh, a time of truth, actually. And also, Uranus rules equality. And um, again, if you think of all the things that have come into to light since 2011, with uh, Malala, she's wanting equal rights for, for, for education for girls. Um, women in Pakistan... Uh, objecting to um, the rape of women and the way women are treated, um, FGM in Sudan, uh, and even as recently as, as, as a couple of weeks ago, we, we had the uh, BBC exposing the pay gap between men and women. <clears throat> and also, <clears throat> excuse me, Uranus rules scientific breakthroughs, um, we've had an incredible uh, breakthroughs in stem cell uh, growing things for, to replace our, our uh, ailing organs. Uh, photon teleportation um, <clears throat> has just occurred. Excuse me. Um, also, when Uranus is in Aries, we get a, a lot to do with... Uh, space discoveries, and we've discover, discovered a lot of Earth-like um, planets. So, that's uh, the Uranus cycle. So, what is going to happen when... Uh, what insights and breakthroughs are we going to have when um, it goes into Taurus, which is only next year, in fact? And it will stay in Taurus till 2025. Now, <clears throat> what does Taurus rule? Well, Taurus rules um, humanity's resources and everything of the earth. Um, also money and banking. So if you can imagine what's, what changes, and they'll be quite sudden as well, they'll come out of the blue to do with those things. I think that checks will disappear. Uh, maybe the Bitcoin will come into its own cash to society, maybe. Um, I think there'll p more than possibly be lots of breakthroughs to do with food production, 
um, waste and cleaning up the planet. I think that will come into focus a lot. Yeah, maybe more interesting things that will counteract the Aquarian stuff, actually. Uh, much more to do with, uh, the, uh, with the material world. So let's look at Neptune through the signs. So what was going on when Neptune was discovered in 1846? Well, um, Neptune nature um, included the discovery of film and photography and aesthetics, mysticism and the fascination with the afterlife. Now, uh, positively, uh, Neptune rules unconditional love compassion and social welfare. It has a very strong spiritual connection. Now, every sign has its positive and its negative aspects. And the negative aspects are more to do with escapism, delusion, illusion. Now, it spends uh, 14 years in each sign. And uh, Neptune was in Aquarius from 1998 to 2011. So if we combined Neptune's longing for connection and Aquarian technology, that's when we saw the phenomenal rise in the mobile and internet use. Uh, in 2011, Neptune had gone round the whole chart and arrived back in its home of Pisces after 165 years. So if we think of the uh, Neptune themes of addiction, illusion, fakery, uh, fascination with the afterlife that, that was all going on um, 165 years ago, um, what kind of addiction do we have now? Well, we do, unfortunately, have a, a big problem with addiction to the internet. And, of course, uh, virtual reality. And th this is a big thing. Because um, the internet, I mean, it's a fantastic tool, isn't it? But if we get too kind of hooked on it, and it does, it, it, it's, it um, invokes chemicals being uh, flooding our brain and making us addicted. There's a massive problem with teenage boys leaving school with a porn addiction. I mean, th these are big issues that I think that have come through, and that's what I was saying about the Aquarian age. They've come through very quickly without us really grasping the effects. And uh, with virtual uh, reality, I mean, we don't even have to be kind of be here at all. Uh, in terms of uh, compassion, what, how we've been seeing that, and also Pisces and Neptune represent suffering. Uh, and I think this has been seen in the whole refugee crisis. And look all that, that uh, Piscean water everywhere. Um, we've also seen an incredible outpouring of compassion for in disasters, such as the Grenfell Tower. Um, now, in terms of fake news, like the last time it was in Pisces, of course, we had a lot of people faking um, spiritual experiences with ectoplasm and uh, fake spirit photography and that sort of thing. But the, this time... We've got uh, fake news, um, which is kind of trying to pull... The, the thing with Pisces is that uh, it's amoral, in fact, and it has no boundaries, and it's almost like anything is possible. So we're, we're seeing that kind of thing. Now, let's look at, at Pluto, the, the, uh, the last of the outer planets. Uh, Pluto was discovered in 1930 and it rules power and control. And if you think back to um, the 1930s, how it manifested with the rise of the Third Reich, um, but more positively, the birth of depth psychology at the time. And because uh, Pluto has an elliptical orbit, it spends anything from 12 to 30 years in each sign. 
So Pluto's themes include death, transformation, and rebirth. So whatever sign it's in, that's when we see um, a great transformation of the things that that sign rules. So when um, Pluto was going through the planet, uh, through the sign of Scorpio, and Scorpio rules death and sex, then we had the whole AIDS thing. When Pluto was going through Sagittarius, Sagittarius rules religion. And we had the great conflagration between uh, Christianity and Islam, culminating in 9-11, basically. Um, so it's, it's very, very powerful. Now it's um, in the sign of Capricorn. So, what does Capricorn rules? It rules institutions. And come 2008, it's just incredible the way um, astrology is so reflective of what's going on. Uh, that's when we had the financial crisis, so the banking institution. So it's all these institutions are going through um, a time of of difficulty and hopefully rebirth by the end of it. Um, the NHS, another institution, has been going through a crisis and also the church, the institution of the church. And I also imagine the whole time that uh, Pluto is going through Capricorn, if you think of the other institution we've got, which is the monarchy, I think we may well see um, changes in that. <clears throat> now, Capricorn rules governments, and um, so think of the power and control of Pluto, and think of the rise in uh, CCTV, and also rules and regulations. It's all very Pluto in Capricorn. Now, Capricorn being an Earth sign rules anything to do with the Earth. So with Pluto going through it, again, there's this, this upheaval and, and change. Lots of, uh, well, hopefully, by, by the end of it, we'll be in a better place. After a Pluto transit, you can never go back. When you have a Pluto transit in your own life, things change permanently. So the Pluto cycle... When it goes into Aquarius in 2023, um, what changes and upheaval are we going to see there? Well, Aquarius is very political, so I imagine that we're going to see big changes in the way that the political system runs. Um, maybe finally realizing the way our voting system really does need to be reformed. Any systems, I think, will come up for transformation during this time. And as you can imagine, these planets, they have um, aspects between themselves. I know it's getting a bit complex, but um, just to briefly say that what we've been going through since uh, 2012 is what's called the Uranus-Pluto cycle, and people... You may have heard of it from astrologers or, or even in the ether. But Uranus and Neptune, they started this cycle in the mid-60s in the sign of uh, Virgo. Here's Virgo. They were both together in the sign of Virgo in the mid-60s. And if you can see what was going on, so you've got the, those two planets come together, and they're the planets most associated with upheaval and change. And again, so then, because Uranus moves faster, it's gone all the way around, and it's now in Aries, and Pluto is in Capricorn, forming the first major aspect since the mid-60s. So it's, we've seen these massive um, changes, but reflected in what was going on in the mid-60s, which, which I think is you know, re really fascinating. <clears throat> Now, let's look 
at some of the things that have been going on and changes that, that uh, Uranus has brought in the, in the last year. So let's have a quick look at the um, referendum. That was David Dimbled me, by the way. Um, now, the reason it probably just means a load of symbols and lines and rings, but it doesn't matter because I'll, I'll just sort of explain it briefly. Now, the chart in the middle is the chart of England, which is the crowning of William the Conqueror on, in 1066. And the reason I, I use this chart was because it was when the Normans invaded and they completely took over our culture, didn't they, and changed it dramatically. There's been a virtual unbroken lines of kings and queens since that time. And the, the, the 1066 is pretty much imprinted on the nation's psyche. Um, now, what you do, if, if a client comes to me and they, they want to kind of know what's going on in their lives, uh, because you can do a, a chart for anything, actually, because everything has a moment in time and you can draw up where the planets are for that moment in time. So countries have charts as well. So you put the person or the country, their chart in the middle, and then the transits for the outside. Now, the key points in the chart would be the sun and the ascendant and the moon. And this line going through the, through the middle here, this is called the ascendant line. It's whatever's coming up over the horizon at, at that moment and is incredibly significant. And everything I've told you about the planet Uranus, here it is on England's ascendant. This is very shocking. It's very revolutionary in a way. It wasn't the result we were expecting, was it? It's Uranus, it comes out of left field. It comes out of the blue and shocks and surprises us. But in a way, he shakes things up. He's the maverick of the solar system. He shakes things up and wants, he wants change. So um, this has been fundamental, I, I think, in, um, in this chart. And the other thing is that the planet uh, Pluto is on, here it is, the planet of, uh, like, the death and transformation is on our Mercury. And Mercury rules contracts. So it's like our contract with the EU. So, you know, it's, it's been a time of, um, I think, very, very significant transits that, that were going on. They should have seen an, an astrologer, I think, before they, they agreed to this. So in a way, Uranus is, is like, you know, he wants freedom from whatever he feels constricted by. And that's what's happened, is that he's thrown us into this new situation. Teenagers have a strong um, Uranus transit, and it usually gives them the oomph to leave home and become independent. It's exactly the same thing. Um, Another significant vote that was going on last year, of course, uh, was the US election. And I thought you might like a little interpretation of um, Donald Trump's chart. Now, uh, fortunately, we do have a birth time for him. Now, Donald Trump is a Gemini. Whatever sun the sign your sun is in, that's your, your sun sign or star sign, some people say. So he's, he's a Gemini. He has no Earth in his chart. Earth is very, uh, you know, sort of grounded. So I don't think he's actually very grounded in his decision-making. Um, what does Geminis love to do? They love to communicate, don't they? And he's the king of the tweeting, isn't he? That's, uh, and with Uranus, you know, think of new technology and in Gemini, uh, the sign of Gemini, that, that's him to a T. So he, again, he's a maverick, isn't he? Um, that sun and Uranus together in Gemini. 
He's got five planets in air. Isn't it interesting, the, these uh, uh, leaders that are, are very airy? Now, um, the sign that was coming up over the horizon when he was born is Leo, king of the jungle. The golden lion rising. He's got glitzy golden buildings, hasn't he? And a golden mane and a golden face. <laughs> and probably golden balls. <laughs> <laughs> He's also got Mars rising. Interestingly enough, Bill Clinton had Mars rising and he was known as penis rising because <laughs> Mars is... I mean, look at the symbolism of it. It's that circle of spirit with the arrow thrusting out. So this, this is, uh, that's a very, very brief um, <laughs> interpretation of Donald Trump. Um, now, unfortunately, and this is really annoying, um, we don't have a birth time for Hillary Clinton. It's really, really annoying for astrologists because we don't know where the ascendant is, which is the moment that she was born. So there's a lot of information we don't have. But the reason I'm showing you her chart in the middle and um, the election on the outside is um, we, we, can gl we can glean um, some information. But one of the striking things is that the uh, the the planet or subplanet or asteroid, whatever you like to call it, Chiron, is on her moon. Now, her moon is her emotional life and it's also the general public. Um, and Chiron is the wounded healer. And when we have a Chiron transit, it often affects our health. And uh, you remember she had that, uh, was it pneumonia? That, that would be very typical of that sign. Thank you. And um, it's also a time when we feel a bit wounded as well, which, which she did after the election. Now, with Trump and the election, um, he has some really favorable transits because Uranus, you know, that's the maverick, here he is, he is aspecting his, his 60 degrees roughly to the sun and six, um, 120 degrees roughly to the to the moon. So that's the sextile and trine. They're really favourable aspects, um, bringing him positive, unexpected luck. And again, it came out of the blue, but in a positive way for him. Um, Chiron is uh, interesting enough. Where's Chiron? Uh, his Chiron is in a square aspect to his sun and moon. He was born on a full moon, by the way. Um, uh, which is, would be exposing his woundedness. And it was interesting how, how much he was also seen as a bit of a wounded figure. And Chiron is also the outsider. He's often the scapegoat. And uh, when we have this kind of transit, that's, ha that's how we feel. Uh, Pluto is square to Pluto. Squares are difficult aspects. Pluto is square to his Jupiter in here, and Jupiter thinks it can do anything. And combined with the power of Pluto, it's like an un unstoppable force, really. Um, Saturn has been opposing Saturn, has moved round now, and since January, it has been opposing his son. And when we have this kind of transit, it can feel like authority, the Saturnian authority, is really making you feel restricted. It's pulling you into line. Remember, I said he's the strict parent of the zodiac. And he'll be feeling incredibly frustrated because he's got no earth in his chart, so he doesn't feel like he should be boundary by anybody. But Saturn is saying, no, you have to follow the rules. And he doesn't like it. So for nine months, he's got that transit going on. So I think we'll see a lot more of this pulling him to, to um, account for things. Now... Um, I just want to talk a, 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 a minute or two on um, Pluto in America's chart 
because what they've got coming up is what's called the Pluto return, which is um, you know very significant because it it takes Pluto so long to go around the whole chart, and so in 2022. Pluto will have returned back to its own place. For instance, when um, with England's chart, when it had its Pluto return, that's when we had the unification of, of Great Britain. So you can see that a country goes through quite a fundamental shift when, when they have this going on. Um, so make a note in your diary for 20, 2022 just to see what um, significant things are going to happen. And also, interestingly enough, uh, Neptune is opposing the natal Neptune this year. So there could well be a, a sort of spiritual renaissance going on in the country. We can't predict exactly what's going to happen. All we can do is, uh, with, as astrologers is understand the essences of these planets. What does this energy mean? What is likely to happen? And so, um, it, you know, we'll watch with interest to see um, what will happen. And if the when Pluto was going over America's ascendant, um, this is what we had. We had 9-11. Uh, and it's almost like Pluto is seen as the dark lord of the underworld in the form of Osama bin Laden uh, coming to attack them, opposing Saturn in Gemini, the Twin Towers, the structure, the physical structure. Saturn rules physical buildings. Um, so you can see the kind of thing that happens when Pluto lands on a sensitive spot in a country's chart. So here we have David Dimbledy back again. I reckon his salary over the last year has been absolutely uh, off the scale. So um, the general election. Frustratingly, we don't have a birth time for Theresa May. But again, another air sign. So she has her son up here in the airy sign of Libra, the same as Margaret Thatcher did, actually. Um, we don't know what her ascendant is because we don't have uh, a, a birth time. Um, she's got Venus in Leo. She might have a moon in Leo as well, but have you ever noticed um, her kitten heels and her leopard skin things? That's, I think, the, the Leo coming out in her. Thank you. And um, what was going on for her? Well, she definitely should have seen an astrologer because if you have Neptune, the planet to do with, you know, escapism and um, basically not really being grounded, going over your Mars. Your Mars is, is, your, is your masculine drive, your energy, your power, if you like. When you have a transit with Neptune going over your Mars, you feel very ineffectual. You know, you feel often quite ill, actually. So she definitely shouldn't have um, run the election with that kind of transit going on. Now, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, another air sign. Now, isn't this fascinating with this age of Aquarius coming in? It's that we're picking up somewhere in the ether. He's a, another Gemini. Um, he had um, also a good communicator. He's got uh, four planets in Gemini. Yeah, a really good orator. And what was happening uh, for him, he had Mercury which rules Gemini, on his son, which is particularly good for um, you know, speaking, public speaking. So that, that was uh, you know, very fortuitous for him. Um, and he had Venus square Jupiter. <clears throat> very fortuitous. I'm actually running out of time, so I'm not sure if I will be able to do the last couple of slides, but... With the Westminster attack, 
this is quite a violent chart. If you think of Mars and Aries to do with um, attacks and that kind of thing, we've got Mars being at the top of the chart, <coughs> the highest planet in, in, the, uh, in the sky. And we've got this incredible lineup in Aries of four planets. Um, so, yeah, that is a real signature for a very violent attack. Um, and of course, with the Glenfell Tower, um, just to show the effect that it had on the country, um, we've got, um, I've got the chart of, the, of, of England in the middle, and um, we've got what's called a, a T-square. Um, with Mars on the midheaven, uh, oh, sorry, no, 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 no. This is to do with um, Chiron. The, uh, it's Chiron. Da, 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 da. God, I can't see it. Oh, there it is. Yes, Chiron on our moon, representing the public, representing a, a, quite a tragic event to do with the public. And we've got... Um, Saturn involved with, with Chiron as well, uh, the actual building. And also, it shows up in the 1801 chart as well, with um, Chiron uh, with uh, Pluto opposite our moon. Now, I just want to finish with um, stepping into the future, which is this our young people. Anybody with children born at the end of the 80s to the mid-90s, they were born with this, what's called a triple conjunction in Capricorn. And uh, this, this era was marked by like, the fall of the Berlin Wall. These, these children incarnated with this energy. Um, they're known as the, uh, because it's Capricorn, they're known as the, the low-risk generation. Um, but they are kind of a, a sensible generation, but they're bringing through something that's very unique because when you have the conjunction of Uranus and Neptune in Capricorn, this is when uh, crop circles really appeared on the horizon because... Uh, Neptune is mysticism and Uranus is uh, the unusual, the unique in the Earth sign. So you get the, the crop circles actually in the Earth. So, um, yes, being a very unique generation. And they're going to take us into the future uh, in, in quite a profound way. A way because all the ages have got their own gods, so we're going to have uh, the new gods coming in uh, to replace them. And we'll have to think what they're going to look like. And I think to if you ask the new generation, my children were born at that time, and I say to them, how do you feel about the future? And they're really excited about the future. They don't have the fears that we have, um, because... They have a different attitude. It's their future, and they're very positive. And I think that um, we shouldn't be so afraid and kind of try and go with the, th with the flow because evolution works that way. Uranus and Pluto wipe away the old to bring in the new, and there is nothing we can do to stop it. So embrace it and go forward with as much kind of knowledge, if you like, as you can. So thank you very much, and I hope that was useful. Thank you very much.